Hello, this is Dr. Nancy O'Reilly, and I would like to welcome you to Smart Amazing Conversations with Dr. Nancy, a podcast that takes a look at stories of life and leadership for smart, amazing women and men like you. The most important thing is showing up. Don't think that you have to bring anything. Bring yourself, show up. And, and remain steadfast and be a... If you are in a position of leadership and a position of management, bring women along with you. Supporting women is my passion and my purpose. And talking with other women and men who promote women's leadership is one of my favorite things to do. I've yet to meet a woman who did not know what she really wanted. She was just either right. afraid to ask the questions or she was afraid of what the answers meant. Their stories connect us and help us to understand that the possibilities are endless if we support each other and lift other women up. Trust is created by persistent identity. I show up as myself time and time and time again. And trust is built. It's one conversation at a time. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy O'Reilly. I'm happy to welcome Kelly Nevins to Smart Amazing Conversations with Dr. Nancy. Kelly is currently the CEO of the Women's Fund of Rhode Island and often speaks about the status of women and girls and why investing in women is profitable, and why using a gender lens to create systems change is important. Kelly has used her master's degree in education and leadership and her expertise in strategic development to lead Rhode Island's social profit sector since 19, 19, since what? Oh, since 1888? No, that's not (laughs) Oh, let's try 1980. <laughs> Boy, you are you look good for your age, by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I apologize. I can't read. This is very small. She is also a, is skilled at motivating teams and individuals and has a good sense of humor, creating workplace equity and developing community relations, uh, community relations tools. She has presented at several conferences for women and and frequently featured on local programming as Go Local Prob. In 2020, Providence Business News honored Kelly as social sector industry leader and received the Secretary of State's Medallion Award in 2021. She was named as the Fellow of Women's Leaders of the World. I'm so pleased to have you, Kelly, and <laughs> please forgive me and my, my. Uh, it's 1980, not, de- not 1880, so welcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited to learn more about what you're doing, and, and we have supported your efforts and will continue to do so because we are women that are supporting women and girls, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad you're with me. Um, you know, as I said, this is a conversation. So some of the questions that you've given to me, I will I will follow. But I always want to start out every conversation for people to learn about you. Sure. But what's important is that so so often when women see other women that are successful and that are are accomplished, uh, they they think it's somehow so easy for them, and things just kind of just have rolled so smoothly along in their lives. And we both know that. Uh, you and I probably have uh, we've had our had our ups and downs, and and here we are doing what we're doing. But we're supporting women. So tell me about you, and how did you get to be the person I'm talking to today? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll take you way back. Uh, so uh, I was born uh, to a single mom uh, who later was a single mom of three girls. Um, and uh, certainly that had influence throughout my life. Um, you know, I, I saw how my mom struggled economically to take care of us. Um, how, you know, the system in many ways seemed to benefit men and not so much women, uh, even when they were trying to do the right thing. Um, I, you know, when I talk about my work, I also talk about how uh, influential it was to see my mom lose jobs because she had to stay home and take care of a sick kid who was unexpectedly sick. Um, and, you know, just how, how it's, it was much easier for men to be able to, to not have to deal with those issues. Yeah. Um, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Uh, and so I, you know, had to navigate uh, uh, financial aid, uh, scholarships, things like that. I'm very proud of the fact that I, I was able to go to college. 
Um, and while I was there, I had this idea that I wanted to go into public relations. But again, um, at, at least at the time that I went to school, I had to work full time to put myself through school. And that meant that I could not participate in unpaid uh, internships, which were the, really the only thing that was offered at the time that I went to school. I actually got my start in the nonprofit sector in 1990. Um, and I... <laughs> Not 1888 or 1980. I was still in, in the uh, undergrad at the, or I was still in grade school at that point. But um, um, in 1990, okay. <laughs> because I could not um, find work in public relations because I had no experience, I decided that I would uh, try the back door. And so I started doing special events planning for nonprofits and realized quickly that um, if I was working in the nonprofit sector, that I could be doing something good for the world and hopefully also being able to pay my bills. Um, and so that's that's how I got my start. Um, I have been in the nonprofit sector in uh, management and fundraising for the bulk of my career. Um, I, I did take a couple of unexpected paths, uh, steps off that path, but I'm, I'm for the most part, have been doing nonprofit work. Yeah. And uh, while I was in grad school, uh, working on my leadership degree, uh, my colleagues in the program said, you know, what do you think you're going to do next? And I said, you know, someday I would like to run the Women's Fund of Rhode Island. And a couple of years later, that opportunity came up and lo and behold, I, I guess I manifested uh, that, that particular wish um, and here I am. So yeah. I, I love the idea that I get to create systems change so that people who experience inequities, who often tend to be women, um, I no longer have to experience those because of the way our systems are set up. Yeah. And uh, so today, uh, the organization that I run uh, invests in women and girls, and we do that through research on the status of women and girls, through advocacy, and we both train uh, leaders to advocate for change in the community, as well as directly advocate for change ourselves. Okay. Let, let me stop you, because yeah, I, sure. I want to go into some more details with you, yep. because First of all, I don't call 501c3 nonprofit. I call them social profit. Uh -huh. I really, when people say that word nonprofit, uh -huh. it, just, it just drives me crazy. So, so, and it really is positive when you, when, because really everything that you're doing is socially profiting your community by mm -hmm. enhancing the well being of women and girls in your, in your, in your state. So if you, if you, if you want to steal it from me, I'm going to give it to you. And I uh -huh. hope you use it. But uh, so, so really, you know, you're a self-made person. And I really like that about you. You, you uh, basically pulled yourself up through the, the ranks and saw, uh, and again, seeing what you saw as a child, watching your mother struggle. Again, you realize kind of what your, your, your role would be, but also maybe the legacy that you're leaving for your sisters and sure. especially your mother. Is your mother still living? She way. is. Yes. And I bet she is so proud of you. I, I, I'd like to think so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, because I mean, I hope you let her see this because it, I think for her to understand that, you know, that she, she did her very best. She worked as hard as she could to. Absolutely. Your, 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 you three daughters, by the way, I have three three daughters also. So, uh, but, but again, you know, that, that leaves a very strong impression that woman who's out there working and doing everything she can to, to take care of her family. I, you know, and again, when you, when a lot of companies are now looking at resumes, believe it or not, we're, we're look, looking at those soft skills. The soft mm -hmm. skills are basically parenting women that can parent and take care of children and work. Uh, that really is a skill and that really, you know, we're, we're the problem solvers, the hand that rocks the cradle rocks the That's world. That's right. Okay. So the, so the women's fund uh, was created, when was the women's fund created in Rhode Island? Yeah. So uh, this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So we were started in 2001. Okay. Uh, our founder, Simone Joyo, was uh, an international 
fundraiser and nonprofit guru who happened to be traveling around uh, all over doing her work and saw a woman's fund in action in Arizona and was really impressed with that work and said, somehow we need to, to do something similar in Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, she came back here. There always has to be a reason though. I mean, what, yeah. did, what did she see? Uh, that oh yeah. Well, really, really made her think that this is the perfect place and it can help women there. You know, there's, I mean, I, I, I have three daughters. So for me, uh-huh. leaving a legacy is extremely important that I leave them something that they can take the baton and they can take, you know, yeah, them, absolutely. Them, like, well, I, right from the get go, she was, she was angry that, you know, uh, that there were these inequities that existed particularly for women, but also, uh, also racial inequities, uh, that she was noticing as well. And, the fact that, um, you know, basically these programs were being created that were meant to impact everyone. But when when there was no gender lens that was being used, what she saw is that men and boys would continue to rise to the top and women and girls would fall through the cracks. And she did her own research and realized, you know, and this is still true today, that less than 2% of funding across the nation goes to programs that are directed specifically at women and girls. Two, less than 2% of, of, of foundational funding. I've never, um, I've never heard that fund. Yeah. Uh, because that's all I do is fund uh, women's programs. So <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I thought it was more than 2%, but uh, that, that really does... Uh, definitely show that we have total a total imbalance as far as yeah. services, and and of course you know all right tell give me a, give me an example of someone who is you have helped through the the women's fund in Rhode Island someone that you would call you know from start to finish now she's a, a success because I know everything that we put out there comes back to us threefold so sure I know that all these women will come back and they'll do something for some other some other woman as well so yeah give sure me, give, me a, give me a story of someone who's just really been in from, from from the women's fund yeah sure so I, first of all i will say that we are less of a direct service organization than one that is engaged in systems change so um we we tend to operate in the the, the spheres of of advocacy if you will okay. Um, so uh, we have a program at the Women's Fund called the Women's Policy Institute that trains a cohort of women to understand how legislative change is made in our community. And together they work on a project that uh, that hopefully changes some of the systems to create a more equitable landscape, particularly for women and girls. So um, in 2012, there was a woman who went through that program. Her name was Gail Golden, who uh, helped to, first of all, pass the one of the first paid leave laws in the United States. Um, Rhode Island was among the first uh, in, in the early days. So that was part of the work that she was doing through the Women's Policy Institute. But also uh, because of her... Uh, learning in the program, it inspired her to run for political office, and she became a senator within our General Assembly. Um, and up until September, she continued to serve in that role, but uh, most recently has now gone to work for the federal government as a senior advisor to the Women's Bureau. Right. So uh, the work that she had been doing locally, uh, she now is able to have national impact from um, as well. So, so that's one person who has had a lot of direct connection and impact with the Women's Fund. Well, th- those are the kinds of stories that when we hear them, we know that anything is possible because what uh, what this policy, uh, this women's policy program is doing is get not only giving women a voice, but giving yes. women a seat at the table. Absolutely. And we have to have both. We have to yes. have our voices, but we also have to have a seat at the table, not around the, not around yep. the table a seat at the table. So that's right. Anybody, anybody else that comes to mind? Because yeah, of- well, I, again, in that vein, um, one of our board members in the late uh, 2000s, uh, Nellie Gorbea, 
um, was so taken by the research that we were doing that was showing the inequities for women and girls in our state that she was inspired to do something. And what she did is run for secretary of state. And she talked specifically about the research that we were, were doing at that time and, and what she wanted to, to work on to change. And uh, she is currently now running for governor. She's still our secretary of state, but she is now running for governor. Mm -hmm. And while we don't, you know, we're a nonpartisan organization. I, I know I've just used two examples of folks who got involved in, in politics. Uh, we're nonpartisan. So, you know, we don't bat candidates. Yeah. We train women to think about what it would mean to run for office. Um, we're actually creating a new program right now that would support newly elected and appointed women who get in office, but it doesn't matter what political party they are affiliated with. It's more about making sure that they have the skills and the tools that they need to enact on the visions that they have for the world. Because like you, Dr. Nancy, we believe that women need to be at the tables where decisions are made and resources are allocated. So we absolutely want to see more women in leadership, both in government, but also leading our local businesses and uh, our local uh, social profits, if you will. <laughs> Thank you for using that. Like yes. That. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm currently the chair of Take the Lead, which is a uh, a national organization that basically is does many many things, but one of the most important things it does is offer it offers curriculum through the court cohort system, which is again the cohorts are based on on particular area it could be law it could be it could be media it could be uh, you know real estate but it's something banking but these are a group of women that are chosen uh, by their cohorts by their by their peers to be represented 50 women and they're basically then going out and, and taking this leadership training and one of the things that we've always found after the training is that the glue that these women create by these cohorts, oftentimes come out saying not only have they developed a, an amazing network of communication and, and, and a network of referral, but for the first time in their lives, they feel the support of other women. Is that is that what you see also in your programming? Again, you're at this level. I, I guess what I'm yeah. seeing is you're up here, you fund here, and then it happens here, and then trickles all over the place. Is that... Is that but, uh, Yes and no. So uh, I, what I will say is, again, we're not, we don't typically have a, a deep programming, but the programming that we do offer, like our Women's Policy Institute, um, is meant to create a, a, a cohort of, of women leaders who, yes, would support each other as they continue to create community change for the better. Um, but we also teach some self-advocacy um, types of things like salary negotiation skills. Um, often women don't realize, That's number huge, one. Huge, uh, yeah. yeah, if yeah. go in and they're already negotiating even before they get the job, women walk in and they, they say you have the job, they go, oh, thank you. But they right. don't negotiate, yes. Right. I mean, right. We have to be better better at the table negotiating our salary, our benefits, and and and, and our promotions within the corporation, because we've got to be thinking ahead as far as where we are. And of course, then we have to be hiring as well the people that we want That's to right. take over as we lift. You know, we, we have a campaign. Uh, of course, I'm going to ask you to become involved with it. I'm sure Kathy or someone hopefully has already asked you the Lift Women Up campaign, which is basically if every woman that you, you all are helping through advocacy or your policy uh, program could lift another woman up as she rises in the system or the political realm that she's in or the corporation that she's in, we'd be in a much different place than we are right now. Sure. All right. So, so this is this is one of your newer programs. What are there other things that you're doing that we should be aware of? That are yeah, new? well, so I, I talked a little bit about the Women's Policy Institutes, but also um, I would note that we are directly advocating for change in the community. I'm really proud that this year we um, helped to pass uh, the Fair Pay Act in Rhode Island, which um, changes 
the definition of what uh, what pay means. Um, so what we are now having our local businesses do is pay women equally for comparable work. Yeah. So, um, you know, of course, we've had this equal pay law book uh, on the books federally for decades, but the courts have chosen to really narrowly define what equal pay means. Um, and so uh, we worked really hard to to broaden what that definition is so that today, um, if you, for example, are an editor in a newspaper and you are working on, let's say, lifestyle stories and your male colleague is working on sports stories, you have the exact same job. You're out at night and out over the weekend at community events. You're doing the same things. You're overseeing the same people. Yep. You just happen to have a different topic that you're working on. Yep. In the past, because there wasn't everything exact about your job description, lifestyles versus sports, uh, an employer could choose to pay you differently just based on that. Today yep. in Rhode Island, that's no longer true. If the the majority of the work that you are doing is comparable, it's it's so similar uh, to your colleague, then they an employer can only pay you differently for some very specific reasons, and that might be longevity within the company. It might be an advanced degree that is directly attributable attributed to the work that you're doing. It might have to do with the amount of travel that you're taking on or the shift that you're working, but they can't just, just indiscriminately pay you differently because they value lifestyle differently than they value sports because the work is the same. Well, I, I know in my own uh, work history, uh, the question of being married would would also define my salary. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Or, or, or even just what your historical pay was. You yeah. can't ask that anymore. If you, have, if you have someone helping to pay the bills, why should you be paid to the salary? Right. Yeah, we 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 you know I'd I'd like to think that we're it's still it's amazing that in 2021 we're talking about these subjects, but here's a subject though that's really concerning me. You know, not only Roe versus Wade, but the the concern of the number of women that are leave that have left and are leaving the workplace and mm -hmm. many are saying they have no intention of returning mm -hmm. uh, they have i guess they have a spouse that's working they have children uh, as you said the, the big issue of flex time and mm -hmm. and daycare is a huge issue and has yep. been uh, and a lot of these even in the schools right now a lot of the after school programs are not continuing you know we still have the covid and the pandemic yep. issue but but what are, you, what are you experiencing in Rhode Island? Because this is something we are really concerned that women can get, connect for good. Are the, you know, we're, we've been making headway of getting women into leadership positions, yeah. women lifting as they rise. But now we've got women going, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm out the door. I, you know, yeah. I, they can't not, do it all. I can't, can. I can't pay. I can't get, I'm not getting paid for what I need. Right. And, I, and I have no daycare. And I, right. can't, I can't go to work and leave my children at home. So, and there's right. no flex time and I can't work from home. They won't let me right. do it anymore. So, yeah. But, and, and so you're, you're noting all of the things, Dr. Nancy, that, that show that this is a fairly complicated issue, right? You know, it's not just one thing. No. Um, however, the pandemic has really lifted up the fact that, you know, uh, we a need women in the workforce and B, that childcare is actually a workforce issue. It's not a parenting issue. Um, yeah. So, so as businesses uh, need to attract more employees now back to their workforces, um, as businesses want to be more productive in this new world, we have to think about how we as a country invest in our childcare infrastructure and recognize that it is not just a parenting issue. Yeah. Um, we need to make it accessible, safe, and affordable. And truly, how do we do that? Um, in addition, uh, we need to pay livable wages. And, you know, the, the pandemic finally broke this, oh, we're going to pay people these sub-poverty wages and then, you know, not allow them to access other benefits because they have a job. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are lots of things that, that need to be addressed. And I think it's really come to light. Yeah. The, the question is, um, what is the people's interest 
in helping to make those changes. Um, well, because, and, and, yeah. and, you know, I, I see it this way, Kelly, that, you know, this is more important than ever that if women don't support each other, the women that are still working or working have to really kind of recruit back the women that yeah. are working and support them. Because, I mean, again, uh, I'm not going to come back to work if, I've, I, if I left a job that I wasn't getting paid well, I'm just as talented as, any, as anybody else. I'm walking out the door. There's no sure. flight of time. Uh, you know, I don't have childcare. But we, we as women, this is our opportunity. And, and men also, if we really, if these corporations are smart and these businesses mm-hmm. are smart, and I'm talking about anything in the community, mm-hmm. social problems, whatever, we have to really, it's about relationships. We have, yeah. we have to truly find people and and have have who have ownership of of what you're doing. You know, you're you're very involved in your in the mission of the women's fund. I'm very involved with the mission of Women Connect for Good. We we have to have some some glue and, and you know I'm I'm supported with wonderful people that I work with, but but I, without the support, I, I'm I'm no good at anything. Without sure. the, I don't nobody gets anywhere alone. So right. So what is the Women's Fund to really, at this point, encourage these women to get back to work, that you're, they're going to get support, that they're going to get the child care that they need, and they're going to get fair pay, and they're going to be able to excel and lift uh, as they rise also uh, in, the, in these corporations or in these social profit organizations or whatever. We, we've got to get back to work. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, that's that's why we focus on the systems change piece. You know, we're working on legislative change both locally and nationally to set the stage for you know uh, creating a better country, uh, a better Rhode Island, and a better country. Um, in addition, you know, we are advising at those tables where uh, you know resources are being allocated and decisions are being made. So, um, I, the members of my board, members of our various volunteer committees, are are actively involved in in trying to guide you know the direction that Rhode Island will take over the next decade and more. Well, they're saying one in three women are leaving. This is and this is you're talking about two percent of social profit. I mean, of women's women's funding for, uh, from social profits, but we're saying one in three women are leaving the yeah. world. Oh yeah, That's, yeah. That that to me is just phenomenal. I mean, I, I can't even think about it. But you know what we're hearing now is that uh, you know they're even saying about Christmas, for example, distribution mm-hmm. is things are being backlogged because they don't right. have people that want to go back to work or willing to go back to work. We, we've got some interesting things that we're going to have to do right now. So the yeah. the companies, this is the time the companies can truly rise. The, the companies that really get it can yeah. rise to the top of the echelon because they understand if they bring these people back in and they keep these people and, and create loyalty and ownership, they're, they're going to be successful in everything they do and sure. spread out into the community. So, so Rhode Island's doing it. Is that right? Well, thank you. Okay. I, I'm glad to hear that. So, all right, I, we're going to end, I'm going to end with a question here. Okay. You're going to tell us more about how women and whoever can find out more about the women's fund at Rhode Island. What advice would you give women right now who want to uh, re-enter the workforce? What is it? What are some of the things that you might say to a woman who's saying, you know, I just don't really know at this point if I really want to go back to work. You know, I don't feel that I get what I need at work or, you know, I, yeah. I need here. What, what's your, what is your advice? Uh, so right now I would say it's a buyer's market, right? Um, if you are, if you think you're not going to be happy at the workplace that you're, you you uh, have left most recently, then I, you know, lots of employers are being very competitive at this point in time and saying, we need to attract people. So we need to do all we can. Uh, now's the time to negotiate. Even if you want, if you're thinking about going back to the workforce that you most recently left, um, you can negotiate for so much. And I would say, you tell your employers what you need, you know, uh, if it's flex time, if it's, you know, the ability to work from home a couple of days a week, 
um, you know, finding different ways uh, to, to help you so that you can be the best employee that they need as well. Yeah. Um, a lot of women at this point in time are also thinking about starting their own businesses. So, um, you know, there's, there's options now, uh, you know, certainly again, the pandemic lifted up the idea that folks who uh, are gig workers or who work from themselves uh, don't have access to benefits. And so there are changes to how communities are providing, for example, unemployment insurance um, and being able to provide overall health insurance, things like that. So, so the game is is changing a bit, and now is is actually a really great time to be negotiating for the things that you need. Yeah, yeah um, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So uh, that's one piece. The other piece is again that um, employers, right? Employees are in such demand that there are often a lot of uh, free or very low cost training programs. So if you're thinking about wanting to change a career, um, reaching out to, we have our Department of Labor and Training, some kind of employment division in your state um, that you could reach out to, to learn about what, what training programs are available to you that maybe you wanna switch careers to something that is a little bit more lucrative for you um, and see what's available. Um, and again, many of those programs are recognizing, oh, it's not just about providing free training, but also wraparound services like childcare um, while you go through those programs. So I, I just think that there's more of a recognition in today's world that it's not as easy as just extending, you know, a, a free class. Yeah. Um, so, could now, call, so could someone call your organization today and say, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how to, how, you know, about how to negotiate uh, going back to work and, and you could give them some, at least some resources and some tips on. Sure. Who yeah. Reach in, who, they, who they can reach in Rota. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. There we go. Well, all right. I want to thank you for today. And I know this is so important. Uh, it, you know, it's little that we do, but it's so valuable and so important that we do when we lift other women up. So I'm going to challenge your organization to become a member of the Lift Women Up campaign. Join it. You can go to our website, drnancyoreilly.com. But then if the women's fund would join, if every woman's, if every women organization would lift, help lift another woman up, lift as you rise. Like I said, we could go through this pandemic and use it as an opportunity to get women back to work, working yeah. where they want to yeah. work, working where they they get the benefits they need, getting the salary they need, and getting the child care and whatever they need to stay in that job and and continue to evolve in that job and excel and and reach leadership positions that are so important because we know companies that have women in top leadership positions, whether they're on boards of directors or at top leadership positions in companies are more successful because of that fact. So yeah, right. So that's what the women's funds got to, has to do. And that's what women connect for good has to do. So we're, we're doing our job. We're doing our best, but uh, okay. So how do they reach you and learn more about the women's fund in Rhode Yeah, Island? sure. So uh, the women's fund of Rhode Island can be found at www.wfri.org. Uh, you can also call our, our phone number at 401-262- Five six five seven. We exist for Rhode Island. There are frankly women's funds all across the United States and probably one serving your community as well. Um, you can type in women's fund. If you go to the women's funding network online, uh, they are a member organization of women's funds across the United States and around the world um, and probably can help you connect to the women's fund that that most is, is most closely connected to you. Um, most states have one. Uh, most large urban centers have one. Uh, because Rhode Island is so small, we are the only women's fund in Rhode Island. Fantastic. So uh, again, if women don't know about this resource and haven't connected with it in their own communities, here's an opportunity to do so. But uh, well, well, Kelly, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I know your mom's proud of you. And like I said, we're leaving a legacy for our, our the women that are coming up behind us. And then we also have to thank the women, of, the women that were standing on their shoulders as well. Absolutely. 
Yes. Your yes. mother's shoulders are big and broad, and I'm sure she's extremely proud of you. So uh, best wishes. Uh, you as well. Women Connect for Good will continue to support you. Uh, we will get this information out. Uh, this podcast will be again aired so that you're able to share it. But uh, thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day and see you soon. Thank you. Be well. Take care. Bye. If you enjoy these smart, amazing conversations, please subscribe, rate, and review them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And read and enjoy more amazing stories in my books, In This Together, How Successful Women Support Each Other in Work and Life, and Leading Women, 20 Influential Women Share Their Secrets to Leadership, Business, and Life. Thank you for listening.